Hi friends, we're back with the next segment of the Egypt game. Um, I want you guys to be thinking about how the Egypt game actually starts. Um, as I'm reading the next two chapters, the chapters are called The Egypt Girls and The Evil God and The Secret Spy. Ooh, it's getting interesting. All right, so um, like I said, I want you to think about how this starts and why also, why do the girls think it's so compelling? Why is it so exciting for them? Um, let's get started. The Egypt girls. All through the month of August, Melanie and April were together almost every day. They played the paper families game and other games, both in the Ross's apartment and in Caroline's. They took Marshall for walks and to the park while Mrs. Ross was gone to her class and almost every day they went to the library. It was in the library that in August that the seeds were planted that grew into the Egypt game in September in the professor's deserted yard. It all started when April found a new book about Egypt, an especially interesting one about the life of a young pharaoh. She passed it on to Melanie, and with, with it, a lot of her interest in all sorts of ancient stuff. Melanie was soon as fascinated by the Valley of the Nile as April had been. Before long, with the help of a sympathetic librarian, they had found and read just about everything the library had to offer on Egypt, both fact and fiction. They read about Egypt in the library during the day and at home in the evening and in bed late at night when they were supposed to be asleep. Then in the mornings while they, while they helped each other with their chores, they discussed the things that they had found out. In a very short time, they had ac accumulated all sorts of fascinating facts about tombs and temples, pharaohs and pyramids, mummies and monoliths, and dozens of other exotic topics. They decided that the Egyptians couldn't have been more interesting if they had done it on purpose. Everything from their love of beauty and mystery to their fascinating habit of getting married when they were only 11 years old, can you imagine, made good stuff to talk about. By the end of the month, April and Melanie were beginning to work on their own alphabet of hieroglyphics for writing secret messages. And at the library, they were beginning to be called the Egypt Girls. But in between all the good times, both April and Melanie were spending some bad moments worrying about the beginning of school. April was worried because she knew from experience, lots of it, that it isn't easy to face a new class in a, in a new school. She didn't admit it, not even to Melanie, but she was having nightmares about the first day of school. There were classroom nightmares and school, schoolyard nightmares and principal's office nightmares, but there was another kind too that had to do with an empty mailbox. In the whole month of August, she had had only one short postcard from Dorothea. Can you guys relate to that? Can any of you relate to that? Nightmares about starting a new school? I think we can, many of us. Melanie was worried too, but in a different way. School had always been easy for Melanie, and even though she wasn't the kind who got elected class president, she'd always had plenty of friends, but now there was April to think about. April was the most exciting friend Melanie had ever had. No one else knew so many fascinating things or could think up su such marvelous things to do. With April, a walk to the library could become an exploration of a forbidden land, or a shiny pebble, pebble on the sidewalk could be a magic token from an, an invisible power. When April got that imagining gleam in her eye, there was no telling what was going to happen next. Just about any interesting subject you could mention, April was sure to know a lot of weird and wonderful facts about it. And if she didn't, you could always count on her to make up a few, just to keep things going. There was only one thing that April didn't seem to know much about. That was getting along with people. Most people, anyhow. With Melanie, April was herself, new and different from anyone. Wild and daring and terribly brave. But with other people, she was often quite different. With other kids, she usually put on her Hollywood act, terribly grown up and bored with everything. And with most grown-ups, April's eyes got narrow and you couldn't believe a word she said. Melanie had gone to Wilson school all her life and she knew what it was like. There were all sorts of different kinds of kids at Wilson, kids who looked and talked and acted all sorts of ways. Wilson was used to that. But there were some things that, Me that Wilson kids just wouldn't stand for and Melanie was afraid that April's Hollywood act was one of them. And Melanie wasn't entirely just guessing about how her schoolmates would react to April. A couple of times when April and Melanie had been, a, been at, the library, at the library or in the park, they'd run into some of the Wilson kids Melanie knew. 
and you could see right away that April wasn't making the right kind of impression and it was going to be worse at school where every kid would feel duty bound to his to do his or her part in trimming the new kid down to size Melanie had a feeling that April wasn't going to trim well the thing that worried Melanie the most was the eyelashes April was still wearing them a lot of the time. She'd gotten so she didn't wear them to the library because she still had trouble reading through them. But even if she, ha if she hadn't had them on all day, she always put them on when it was time for her grandmother to come home. Once, Melanie asked her why. She doesn't like for me to wear them, April said. Melanie thought about that for a minute. Then she said, you don't like your grandmother very much, do you? April just shrugged, but her eyes got narrow. I don't see why, Melanie said. She seems pretty nice to me. She doesn't like my mother, April said. She doesn't even think that Dorothy is going to send for me to come home pretty soon. Did she say so? No, but she thinks it. I can tell. Then, just at the beginning of September, with school only a few days away, came that exciting day when the Egypt game began. April and Melanie and Marshall were on their way home through the alley when, by the sheerest luck, Melanie noticed the loose plank. It had moved stiffly that first time, with a reluctant rusty yelp, and they peeked through into a hidden and deserted yard. It was fascinating, so weed-grown and forgotten and secret, but then came the most unbelievably wonderful part of all. There she was, waiting for them in the shed, Nefertiti the beautiful queen of ancient Egypt, like a magical omen, or, as April had put it, a beautiful messenger from out of the ancient past. There had to be something terribly out of the ordinary about it. Why, it had only been a few days before that they had read all about her and admired a picture of her lovely sculptured head. And there it was, almost like magic. Very much like magic, in fact, and that's the way the Egypt game was from the very beginning. But even the discovery of Egypt didn't stop the beginning of school from arriving with all its problems. So when April lost one of her eyelashes that first day in Egypt, Melanie couldn't help feeling a little relieved, although she wouldn't have said so. But then there it was on security and the problem was just as complicated as, as ever. It was the next morning when Melanie finally got up nerve enough to talk to April about it. April was helping Melanie dry the dishes so they'd be ready to leave for Egypt sooner. Are you going to wear your eyelashes to school? Melanie asked with careful casualness. But April qu turned quickly, and with her face all shut up the way it was with other people. Sure, she said. What? Are you serious right now? Do you see this? What a weirdo. Anyway. But April turned quickly, and with her face all shut up the way it was with other people. Sure, she said. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I just don't think anybody else at Wilson wears them. April's chin went up and her lips thinned. Am I supposed to care what the kids at a little old place like Wilson School wear? Melanie could see that she wasn't going to get anywhere, so she just let the subject drop. But before the dishes were finished, she had started making a drastic plan. April just couldn't wear those eyelashes to school on the first day. She's going to be hard enough to integrate, even without them. As soon as Melanie had finished her chores, they were free to head for Egypt. Since it was Saturday, Melanie's parents were both at home, but Mr. Ross always had to study, and he was only too glad for the girls to get Marshall out from underfoot. Just outside the apartment door, April stopped with her finger to her lips. She warned, We must proceed with caution. We may be being watched. Who's watching? Marshall asked, looking around. The enemies of Egypt. Who are the worst enemies, Melanie? The Syrians, Melanie whispered. Yeah, they're the ones, the Syrians. Their spies are everywhere. With elaborate caution, they made their way out of the back door of the Casa Rosada and down the alley. They went the wrong way first and took evasive action through a garage and around a stack of garbage pails. Then they crawled through a piece of cement pipe and started to make a run for it. But they had to go back for Marshall, who was still in the pipe, all tangled up in security's legs. When they finally arrived at the fence, they were out of breath. All clear? Melanie asked, looking both ways. Yes, for the time being, 
April breathed. But they almost had it. Had us. That was a close call back there in the tunnel. Close, Melanie agreed. But we fooled them. With that, they shoved Marshall through the hole in the fence and crawled in after him. I want to go back to something. At the beginning of the chapter, it mentioned that she, you know, she was having nightmares and she was, you know, really worried about school. And then it said that she had another kind of nightmare about an empty mailbox. And it says, in the whole month of August, she had had only one very short postcard from Dorothea. So the entire month of August, 31 days, only one short postcard from her mom. How do you think she feels about that? Why do you think her mom only sent her one little postcard? Interesting. All right, next chapter. The Evil God and the Secret Spy. When April and Marshall and Melanie squeezed back through the fence for the second time, they found everything just as they had left it. They started out by pulling the rest of the dead weeds and stacking them in one corner of the yard. While Marshall stood, half, stood guard halfway down the alley to see if anyone was coming, they shoved the whole stack out through the hole in the fence. Then they scouted around and found a trash bin that was nice and roomy and not too full to hold, the extra, to hold an extra donation of dead weeds. When at last the loose stones and broken bits and things had been cleared away, Egypt looked clean and bare and ready for whatever might be going to happen. Next, they turned their attention to the lean-to shed, or the temple, as they were already beginning to call it. It was actually only a wooden platform about a foot off the ground across the end of the yard. A roof of corrugated tin was supported in the front by a few wooden posts, and on the other three sides, walls were formed by the tall boards of the fence. Already, the birdbath altar of Nefer Nefertiti, the fancy pillars from the porch of some Victorian mansion, and the crumbling statue of Diana by the entrance were beginning to create a temple-like atmosphere. But there was much more that could be done. April and Melanie were sitting on the edge of the temple's floor, resting for a moment, and planning, when April pointed out the only real door to the storage yard. It was on the opposite site from the loose plank, and was apparently locked with a latch and padlock from the outside. I wonder where it goes to, she said. Melanie thought a moment. I guess it goes to the rest of the professor's backyard, she said. You know, that part with the driveway so trucks and things can back up to a store for deliveries? You can see into that part from the alleyway. It was right then when she mentioned the professor that Melanie, for the first time, had an uncomfortable feeling. What do you suppose the professor would do if he caught us in here? She wondered out loud. April shrugged. Melanie had told her how most of the children in the neighborhood felt about the professor. While she, didn't, while she had to admit he'd been a little bit creepy, she didn't see what all the fuss was about. But Melanie f seemed to feel that April's short talk with the old man had made her an authority on the subject, so she was more or less obliged to come up with an opinion. I don't think he'd do a thing, she said. I just don't think he'd even care as long as we don't bother him or hurt anything. Besides, how's he going to know? You can tell by the weeds and everything that no one's been in here for ages. I'll bet the padlock on that door's rusted so tight he couldn't get in if he wanted to. And that window isn't the kind that opens. He'd have to break the glass if he wanted to get through. He might be watching us through it, though. Somehow, that thought was almost more scary than the possibility of the professors actually entering the yard. With one accord, the girls moved warily towards the window. Closer and closer until their noses were only inches from the dirty panes. Then Melanie breathed a sigh of relief. <sighs> There's something like a heavy curtain hanging clear across it. He couldn't see through that. Besides, I don't think he could see through the dirt even if there wasn't a curtain. I'll bet this window's in some little back room he doesn't even use anymore. Otherwise, he wouldn't leave it so dirty. Feeling pleasantly safe and secure, the girls sat back down and began to make plans. Marshall was busy digging a little hole in the middle of the yard with a sharp stick. He had knotted two of Security's legs together around his neck so that his hands could be free for digging. Security's pear-shaped plush body and six of his black legs were hanging down Marshall's back. I know, April said suddenly. Marshall can be the young pharaoh, heir to the throne of Egypt. Only there's a civil war going on and the other side is trying to kill him. Okay, and we can be high priestesses of Isis who are assigned to protect him. Um, April said. 
Or else we could be evil high priestesses who are going to offer him as a human sacrifice on the cro crocodile altar to... What was that evil god's name? Set? Yeah, that's the one. April jumped to her feet. Throwing up her arms, she chanted, Almighty Set has promised his servants, the crocodile gods of the Nile, the bloody heart of the young pharaoh Marsh... Uh, Marsha Moses. She dropped to her knees. O oh, mighty set, god of evil, we hear and obey. Marshall had stopped digging, and now he stood up and started towards the opening in the fence. The girls ran after him. He didn't struggle while they caught him, but Melanie was familiar with the expression on his face. His funny little baby round chin was sticking out defiantly, and his black eyes glared. Leave my bloody heart alone, he said. The girls giggled. You know, he's pretty sharp for a four-year-old, April said. Here's a picture. See his little face? <laughs> Melanie got down on her knees and tried to take Marshall's hands, but he wouldn't turn loose of security. Marshall, honey, it's just a game, she said. Just pretend. We wouldn't really hurt you. What's a pharaoh? Marshall asked suspiciously. A king, Melanie said. King of all the Egyptians. Marshall's frown lifted a little, and his chin began to go back into his normal, its normal position. A terribly important kind of king, April said. Everybody had to bow down to him and do exactly what he said. Marshall nodded soberly. I'll play, he said. So that was the way Set started. Set, the god of evil and black, black magic. At first, he was just supposed to be a character in that particular game. And that first day, he was represented by a picture of a man with an animal's head that Melanie drew on a piece of cardboard and tacked to the wall. But once he got started, he seemed to grow and develop almost on his own, and all out of control, until he was more than evil, and at times a lot more than Egyptian. For instance, at different times, his wicked tricks included everything from atomic ray guns to sulfur and brimstone. But actually, that was the way, that was the way with all of the Egypt game. Nobody ever planned it ahead, at least, not very far. Ideas began and grew, and afterwards it was hard to remember just how. That was one of the mysterious and fascinating things about it. On that particular game, on that particular day, excuse me, the game about Marsha Moses, the, pharaoh, the boy pharaoh, and Set, the god of evil, didn't get very far. They'd no more than gotten started when April and Melanie decided they'd just have to have, to have some more equipment before they could play it well. So they postponed the game and went, in, went instead to scout around in the alley for boards and boxes to use and making things like thrones and altars. They found just what they needed behind the donut shop and the furniture store in the next block and brought them to Egypt. And it was on the same trip that they had the good luck to rescue an old metal mixing bowl from a garbage pail. April said it would be just the thing for a fire pit for building sacred fires. When they had everything as far as the hole in the fence, they ran into a problem. The bowl and the boards went through all right, but the boxes were just too big. The only solution was to throw them over the top of the fence. It wasn't easy, and in landing, they made quite a bit of noise. It wasn't long afterwards that the curtain on the small window at the back of the professor's store was per pushed very, very carefully to one side. But April and Melanie were so busy building and planning that they didn't notice at all. Only someone with a very sharp eyes would have been able to see the figure that stood silently behind the very dirty window in the darkened room. Ah, so now we're back to the very beginning from the professor's perspective. Ah, so again, why do you think the author chose to start it, start the story from the, the professor's perspective, kind of in the middle of the story? And then we're kind of coming back full circle. Interesting. All right, well... I have another question for you. Why do kids play imaginary games? These girls are playing an imaginary game. They're about your age. Why are they playing imaginary games? Do you think they're too old? Do you think they're just the right age? What age should kids stop playing imaginary games? Should they stop? Hmm. Well, something interesting to think about. Right. We will read the next section tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you soon. Bye.